All right. Uh, Good morning. Um, so uh, I wanted to hit on a couple. I'm Tom McGilloway from Mahan Reichel in Baltimore, and I wanted to hit on a couple experiences that I've had uh, over the years working in different communities and uh, placemaking, primarily leveraging how to activate spaces. I'm going to cover real quick six guidelines. A lot of it parallels what Ronit just uh, said, and then follow up with a lot of precedent examples. I'm not going to go into any deep dive on any precedents, but I want to just give a snapshot of different communities from very small interventions to larger, more complex interventions. So first of all, uh, being authentic to place. I think uh, Ranit hit that very well. And you know, in order to be authentic to place, for a good place, you really have to engage the community. And from our experience, uh, when you engage the community, a lot of great and unanticipated ideas come out of that. Sometimes you go in into these with some expectations, but then there's always some wonderful surprises. It's also to build that sense of ownership from the participants, because those owners are going to be dependent upon to help program and maintain some of these places we create. Uh, context, considering the edges. A lot of times we worked in communities where folks said just because there's a park or an available space want to do something with it, but it might not have the right edges. It might not have the right uses around it. So we want to take that into consideration. And how, uh, while a lot of spaces have to be programmed, you also want to think about how do the uses around it um, also activate it on a daily basis. Getting bang for the buck, uh, building upon your assets and even some utilitarian projects. And um, you know, start, you can make the most impact if you start with your assets. And again, it goes back to authenticity. Um, how can you achieve multiple goals with, um, with uh, your project? And then uh, being able to adapt and repurpose the space with changing needs without a lot of reinvestment. And I think these presentations will be available online. Is that correct? So I, I'm going to go through this really quick, and I see people scribbling, so it will be available. Um, number four, making it doable, easy, quick, and cheap. Um, you know, a lot of these, if it's temporal or it's just experimentation, you don't want to necessarily put a lot of investment in. So how can you consider temporary activation while you're raising funds or planning long-term improvements? Um, not getting too hung up on the design. As a designer, sometimes that's hard. You get focused on the design, but you really want to focus on uh, the flexibility of space, simplicity and construction with minimal complications. Flexibility. Um, again, coming back to not over-designing, uh, avoid being too activity-specific. You want to allow for programming and activities that evolve over time and build upon the people using the space, and it's constantly changing. And then lastly, committed leadership. Um, really uh, having a willingness to try something new. And in a lot of our communities, that's probably one of the biggest challenges. It's really important to involve those decision makers very early in the process. It's an education process. Uh, a lot of times we have to really share successes and data from other communities to help convince some maybe reluctant leaders in, in trying something new. And then it, being aware that it takes time. So sometimes you don't want to get hung up in uh, the hurdles, but uh, you want to uh, look at some things that you could do quickly, but then also at the same time be educating and bringing leaders on board. So a couple uh, precedents. Uh, the first one really, uh, it, it builds on some of the things Ronit talked about in terms of places of play and places of rehearsal. This is Open Up Baltimore. We, uh, per, our office participated as part of the parking day. Uh, this is Mondawmin Mall on the left. You see it's the Mondawmin Mall is in the center. There's a metro transit hub and then a high school at each end of the mall. And we wanted to do three things with this project. One was, um, work with the mall owners to try to demonstrate how they can create some of their outdoor space as more of a place rather than just a parking lot. We wanted to work with the transit agency to create some place around a transit hub. And then also we wanted to create some open dialogue with the community. This was shortly after uh, the riots in Baltimore. Um, so the theme was open up and it really was open up about anything you wanted to open up about. We brought on partners, uh, the police, the transit authority, since this is a transit station, university, 
universities, local architects, community leaders, they all participated. Um, and uh, the places of play, it was really important to get some activity to have that engagement in, in form of play and whether it was uh, writing your thoughts since this was a transit connection. Uh, we just had two simple questions, where are you coming from, where are you going? And it was really great that we got some very cerebral responses and then some very uh, the basic responses as well. And then different ways for people to engage with the partners, whether it's constructing something um, or creating art on the sidewalk. And since we do a lot of engagement in our work, this was also a place of rehearsal uh, that Ronit talked about. It was a place for us to rehearse different techniques for getting community input, to see what worked and what didn't work. Fishbone Alley, uh, every community has alleys like this. Uh, fund a, you know, a primary place of service, uh, not very attractive. And when I talked about the importance of context and what's on the edges, this was an alley where, in this case, the leadership of economic development wanted to transform this, uh, recognize the potential for this alley. But it couldn't really work in any old alley. Uh, it could, this alley had a lot of restaurants around it that were also already doing some outdoor courtyard spaces. So there's an opportunity to leverage that activity. Um, it's been transformed. We had a workshop with the community. And uh, it's really been transformed into a place in downtown Gulfport, Mississippi. And uh, I think the, the fundamental thing, the major investment here was in the paving materials, some reuse of some block from another salvage street, and then the overhead lighting. The rest of it were very simple interventions with artists. And actually, uh, there was a lot of initial talk of doing elaborate coverings of the utility boxes. And uh, you know, we discouraged that and said, you know, the utility, the, the function of the alley is what makes this a cool place. It's still a service alley, but it's been transformed, local artists. There's not a lot of investment, so these art, uh, this art and these coverings can be transformed on a regular basis. We shared data and examples from other places like Seattle's Alley Network that showed movies in the alley. That really resonated with the community, so now they're doing it in their own alley um, as well. And then it, it's, I think, a sign of success is when people start placing a, a, a posting on their social media that hey, I'm in Fishbone Alley today, and there's been a lot of posts that this has become an identifiable place in, in Gulfport. And a, a quite a bit of a transformation, a transformation um, with not a, a significant amount of um, investment. On a larger scale, the Sandlot in Baltimore, this is Harbor East, uh, a redevelopment um, over uh, many years. Uh, the uh, ultimate master plan shows down in the left corner a, uh, a park, a new park that's over a cap of a former chemical plant contaminated landfill there. But until that's not going to happen for several years, so the developer of this project wanted to do something to get people started to think about this as a destination. And so they brought in a whole lot of sand um, and uh, calling this the sand lot. So that's the area circled here. Um, it's, I talked a lot about cheap and doable and transformable materials. These are all, all the plants are in wooden crates that can be moved and used somewhere else, uh, hammocks, a lot of, um, uh, uh, forgetting the name, um, uh, pallets, wood pallets are used in the construction of the fencing, uh, some string lighting. So all the materials used in here, container ships for the restaurant, can all be used somewhere else when this becomes more of a permanent space. But it's really become a significant activity generator uh, for the community. And I think one of the challenges that we'll run into is when it does become a permanent park, there'll probably be groups emerging of save the sand lot because they, they like the temporary installation. But it's great. There's not a lot of investment that people can mold it to what they want. A project that I'm uh, involved in uh, in Baltimore, the Wyman Park Dell, it's a historic Olmsted Brothers Park. Uh, it's the, the central focus is this uh, central lawn. Um, and w several years ago, we did a master plan for the park, and there's, uh, there was a lot of interest from the community of creating more activity in the park. And because of that central lawn has a historic significance, there's not a lot of opportunity to fill it with stuff. But up at the corner, at the street level, the area that's highlighted, there is an opportunity. And we did a workshop at the playground several years ago. The existing playground, it was not a very exciting place to be. And, and just a, an example of a very simple intervention, that uh, the, the wood retaining wall there, 
if parents would sit on that, but their backs were to the playground, they'd be looking out. And so when we did, we had a playground, a placemaking workshop with community residents, and one of the things that came out was, you know, we want to be able to watch our kids play. So in the ultimate design, we sunk the playground in the ground, put a retaining wall on the high side of the playground, so when you sit on the wall, you're actually looking into the space and you feel like part of a space. It's a very simple uh, thing, but it, it makes a difference in how people People use the space. There was a lot of desire to get more color into the playground, and so this is an example of the final project. But the, when I talked about, um, you know, you always get surprises when you involve the community. There was a group of Marines that participated in the, the, the workshop, and they said, what about getting ping pong? And you said, yeah, it's a great idea. We don't have that in our budget. We haven't thought about that, but if you want to make it happen, make it happen. They did a Kickstarter campaign, raise money. We helped facilitate getting the um, uh, ping pong table in place, and that was just really adding on. So now the parents have something to do while the kids are playing. And then that just spiraled into other things. We had a donor come forward that donated uh, portable chairs and tables, and then someone else came along and built a, a place to hold the ping pong paddles and ping pong balls. And, and then we had another group that raised grant money to install a shade sale. So incrementally, these things have been building upon um, these a very simple uh, workshop that started and it's become really a catalyst for the, the community. We have uh, university students that help maintain it on a regular basis, and then it becomes the site of several festivals in the community as well, when it was a really uh, a plain playground. And then it really, from the success of that, Five years later, the community wanted to focus on the other corner of the park, and so we just had a, a workshop at last fall and then developed some plans for where the um, Confederate monument came down in the city for that space. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, flood mitigation. Uh, we all know the story of Ellicott City. I'm not going to get into the controversial parts of that, but. Um, uh, we had Upper Main, Lower Main is the part that you've probably heard a lot about where the buildings were being removed. We've been working on the master plan here. On Upper Main, there are a lot of large surface parking areas. Uh, this is all part of the master plan from the previous administration. We're now hitting restart with the new administration, going to be looking at that. But some of the ideas that show how a utilitarian project can be uh, used for placemaking, um, one of the, the needs of Ellicott City was to improve the conveyance, the ability for the channels to convey water. One area where you could do that was in these large public surface lots that are covering a lot of the channels are buried. So in the master planning process, looking at opening up that uh, channel, widening it so it could handle the conveyance, but in doing so, we lose a significant amount of parking. The market data in the study yielded that there was a need for larger footprint space that could attract other retailers. And so we looked at, well, how can we take this flood mitigation project, but also accommodate multiple goals of creating a parking structure, but wrapping that with some additional uses uh, that were uh, as part of an economic development strategy. So the before area, this was, again, just a surface parking lot, and then showing the potential that rather than just a wide LA channel, wide engineered channel, how could we make this a place that you know, it accommodates flood waters, but most of the time it uh, has some activity. And the, the flood maps, the, the purple and red, are the deepest flood waters, and you could show lot D has a lot of flood waters in, but with the conveyance improvement, it shows how it's conveyed to the channel um, in this area. So the, the, the point of that is, um, so as the, now that the master plan, uh, the, the administration is putting in a large tunnel bore, this is no longer needed for flood mitigation, but it's still an opportunity to do some of the placemaking in what is just a surface parking lot. Leonardtown, Maryland, we're working there, uh, uh, shaping their square. Again, a lot of committed leadership. Um, they call their whole downtown the square because at the center of it is this wonderful square. But like many places, it's meticulously maintained and landscape, but it's really unusable. It's filled with stuff. There's a hedge. There's no shade where you need it. 
uh, low cherry trees that block all your visibility and very wide roads that make uh, difficult pedestrian crossing. So we're looking at an interim scheme on the left that shows uh, you know, what you can do to enter, uh, create some placemaking in the early days and then a longer term plan on the right that is a lot more capital investment. We've used examples from New York. We're using pots and just painting some of the, the asphalt to uh, widen the pedestrian area but narrow the vehicular area. It's a very easy uh, uh, thing that could be done in the short term to create more space. Um, this is the existing condition in a model view, so taking out the hedges, adding more shade, and then doing some of those pots to narrow the street is something that's very doable in the short term. And then that sets the stage for longer term, more permanent investment, and it also allows for them to experiment with that. And then I'll wrap, uh, coming back here to Frederick, Maryland. I've uh, been working uh, several, about seven years ago, did a placemaking workshop for a small uh, park at the north end of Market Street. There's a historic found, a wonderful space, highly visible, but it's not very utilized. Again, drawing on the community leadership, we're doing a workshop out into the space, discussing ideas that led to some plans, and then seven years later, a uh, private uh, donor wants to invest in this, so we've been working uh, with Frederick in doing um, uh, expanding that plan, taking the ideas from the community and making this more of a place, using things like uh, a big bench platform that could also function as a stage, incorporating electric and water so that they could have some performances, putting in portable furniture so that people can adapt the space to their needs, opening up sight lines so you could see into and out of the space. And one of the things that the, the big focus, and then using examples from other places to show how the place could be programmed and used and help uh, people visualize the ideas. And, and Frederick has such a great commitment to the arts. One of the things was to look at art uh, as a way to put into the pavement where this crossing it, into the parking lot goes. This is met with resistance from uh, the engineering department, the highway department. Uh, but when I talked about this commitment to leadership, we have a very great leader here in Frederick who is saying, I'm not willing to let this die. We got to fight for this. Other places have done for it successfully. Uh, we can do it too. And that leader is right here and she's going to speak, uh, speak next. So thank you very much. I'm Kara Norman with Downtown Frederick Partnership, and um, as Tom has alluded to, sometimes I'm a little feisty about what I think should happen. Um, so I thought I'd give a little context. I'm with Downtown Frederick Partnership. You've heard from an educator, a consultant, and now you're hearing from the nonprofit that um, feed on the ground. So as context, we're the Main Street organization here. We work to promote, preserve, and enhance the livability and viability of Downtown Frederick. Um, this is where we work. I just show that to show that we have a large downtown, um, and so it's a big area within which we work, and that's our focus in terms of placemaking. Here's the whole crew. There are a total of four of us, so we're a pretty small staff. Leanne is in the audience, so if you can't find me later, Leanne can wave her hand. You can find her, and she can answer your questions just as well as I can. So how did the partnership get into placemaking? Um, we have always, as an organization, been focused on the experience um, and what the experiences you have in our downtown. Um, I don't think that that's new or, or insightful. That's been something we've been talking about for a long time, but placemaking is a great way to ha ha make that happen. We are always looking at other communities and what they're doing. And Pitchcraft, which is the main, main point of my conversation, actually came from a consultant we hired for a purpose not even related to placemaking necessarily. We've grown the excitement within our board of directors. We did a placemaking exercise at a board retreat and they all went around and identified what kind of placemaking thing they want to see happen and they had a great time. And the enthusiasm for the idea has only grown since that time. And there's also a real strong desire to include our community in meaningful ways. Downtown Frederick is changing in terms of the people who live here, the people who come here. Um, and we find it increasingly important to expand that conversation so that we can do the work that we want to do with everyone else, not, not in, in a different way. So we've done a few projects. Our first one was blue chairs. It's pretty simple. We each painted chairs blues and we put blue and we put them all over downtown Frederick and we invited you to take a, take a seat. Um, and it was a part of our first Saturday, which like many other organizations have similar events like that. 
We got a little bigger. Um, and this is um, Dino Alley, and if you guys want to go check it out, it's on the side of the Church Street parking garage. You're not really going to see it from the street. Um, when you do something a little bit wackier, sometimes it's good that it's a little bit behind. So if you know where Brewer's Alley is, walk down the alleyway beside Brewer's and you'll find Dino. Um, that is the Maryland State Dinosaur, so there is some, you know, relevance to our, our history as a state. Not really. But it is really our state down for. Um, and then placemaking, we kind of, we keep getting bigger and bigger. So um, holiday lighting, we took over the holiday lights from the city in this past year and changed the form of that. And it made a huge impact in terms of brightness and excitement about downtown in the holiday season. So I'm here to talk to you about Pitchcraft, which was our first ever placemaking competition, which we did in um, October of last year. And to kick it off, I also have a video, so just to kind of show you what we did. So hopefully that gives you a quick synopsis of what our first pitch craft ever was. It was a great success. I thought you'd first be interested to know who won. Um, so those two lovely young ladies, Tiffany and Chanel, proposed the idea of doing Frederick bike racks in ASL. Um, and that was the winning project that got the proceeds from um, the ticket sales that night. It was an unexpected um, additional goodness that happened during the event. Um, and so uh, we had a community member step forward and fund the joy of music. So during the event, she n nodded me over and said, um, announce right now that I'm paying for that. And it was stunning, but cool. And so we have a second one. The joy of music is actually mounted directly outside on the creek level. Um, the, the plaque part is still in, in the works, but you can go out there and play a little if you need a little musical interlude in your day. And then um, after that, we had a third community member who stepped up anonymously the next day and funded a third project. So our intent was to do one, um, and we're ending up doing three. And this is Candy Lane. It's a life-size board game, so um, you may have heard of Candy Lane, which is trademarked. This is Candy Lane, um, and it will, it's ultimately now actually going to be um, in uh, Baker Park, um, and children and parents and everyone can interact and do, can play, pay a life-size version of that board game. So, um, the details are how we achieve this in case you guys want to do pitch craft in your community. Um, the key pieces for us was that we had a lead volunteer who signed on. Susan, who you saw in the video, was amazing and took a huge part. This was on our wish list, but not on our possible list until we had that volunteer support. We had the application process open for about two months. We did a lot of outreach via social community partners, event committee members, but I will say we were highly focused on personal connections that we had to encourage people to spread the word. That said, all of the people, of all the people who pitched, I had met two of them before. The, the, like the ladies who won, never met them before. It was, a, it was a, um, a great thing. And I will say that's just like a quirk of life, but now DeMarco, I don't know if you guys, but he was on America's Top Model. He's probably our most famous, one of our most famous residents. And he put it out to the deaf community that, that you really should respond to this. And that kind of, our local celebrity endorsing it was huge um, and really changed the results of what happened, which was awesome. We do um, review of all those projects prior to us narrowing it down to the four. So we have a technical advisor committee. We got input from city staff. We previewed them all with our historic preservation staff to make sure that we would have a good chance of approval when the time came. It was absolutely critical that the project functioned unattended. Um, and then we were also, our key criteria for us was budget. Um, we had four pitchers who were announced about a month prior to the event date. That allowed us to focus on getting their people to the event, because um, obviously you want people to come and vote for you, so it gave us an opportunity to achieve that. Um, we then moved our outreach to focusing on buying tickets. We did an on-location run-through in advance. These are all amateurs. Nobody had done this before, and the idea of pitching your idea live in front of an audience of 180 people is intimidating to the best of us, and especially to someone who's never done it before. So it was really great um, to have that opportunity for them. Um, and then we had the actual event. The winning project was selected, and during the event, we asked for additional support in terms of funds and volunteers, and we also provided the opportunity for pitchers and the public to interact and gather. So we thought that three wouldn't be selected and the community would go off and do that. It turned out better than that, but that's what we expected. Um, 
We then mow through approval. So we outreach to those winning pitchers. And this is quite honestly the hard part. Um, it's different in everybody's community, but I will say the city approval process is a longer slog than any volunteer has ever imagined or anticipated coming their way. So we met with city staff. We go to the Public Art Commission, the Park and Rec Commission, the Historic Preservation Commission. So it's a lot of work to get those projects approved. It's an incredible sink of staff time. Um, and then construction should be completed by this coming October. So here's what we learned, and I'll go really quick because I want you guys to have some time for questions. Um, we highlighted that space that we're in is super cool, and it really helped attract people to our space um, and to this brand new event, but it was expensive to produce an event in a space that is not occupied. Um, so I, I say that to say we do that purposely. We often do things the hard way. I look at John. John and I have lots of conversations. John um, visits Frederick about why we seem to have a propensity for the hard way. But in this case, the hard way was to highlight a, an available building space the downside is it was we had to go through a permitting process to get approval to use it and it was more expensive. On the other hand, people thought it was so cool to be there, so we had a really good participation. Pluses and minuses. Really prepping their pictures is really key. You want them to feel comfortable. The whole event rests on the presentation that they put forward, so spending time with them to make sure that they're ready to do that is really important to the success of your event. Um, a strategy for cost overruns. All of those three projects all have come in over budget. One to an extreme amount. The Frederick bike racks in ASL, I'm not sure what happened, but they thought that the bike racks were one price, then we got to this other place, and we went from a $4,000 project to a um, uh, $16,000 project. So the cool thing is, is they went out there, raised the money, and we made it happen, and we're, I'm waiting for one more approval, and I'm going to order the bike racks probably tomorrow. Um, so it's all good, but the budget and what you don't anticipate, it's like in this case, they had the wrong cost for the bike racks. They didn't anticipate putting additional brick pavers under the bike racks because the city wouldn't let us put it on the existing pathway. We had to widen the pathway. There are a bazillion little details that happen that make things more complicated. So I don't know how you, we haven't quite figured out how to anticipate that, but that's a challenge of this type of a thing. Um, and then preparing those pictures for a lengthy approval process. Um, I don't know, our goal and our wish was that explaining and taking people through this process would mean that other people would do it without us. I don't know that we're gonna achieve that goal, but that was our wish. And that's it. Um, Pitchcraft is going to be held again this October 24th. You are welcome to come. If you have spend your 20 bucks on the ticket, you too can help pick the winning project for the next year. Um, and actually, our application process is totally open, so anyone can apply. Any of you in the room can put in your placemaking idea for downtown Frederick. And then that's how you find us.